So uh, they said, go get Brother Hustle. I said, no, no, go call my wife. Get my wife in here. <laughs> they finally did get DJ. So that was uh, uh, that's a good one. So uh, yeah, what a what an interesting time we live in, right? A snake loose in the church. Boy, you preach that. <laughs> that preach that. Preach that. Well, praise the Lord. That's all taken care of. Thank the Lord for DJ and others. I would have actually like to see every all these men watch as my wife handles that snake because that would have been very funny. She was already off to a Sunday school. Room, so. For those who didn't hear, we found a bull snake in one of the Sunday store and just cut it out. So, not a dangerous snake, it's a chicken snake from next door. No telling how it got in here, maybe the door was left open or who knows what happened. You know, I, I feel that too because I do know there's snakes in the church. <laughs> they, they might be, and there's no way to dive in them. <laughs> well, let's not go there. Praise the Lord. You know, uh, today's world, and welcome everybody, welcome our guests and sisters. We'll have you yeah, here today for Mother's Day to celebrate that. And uh, in the process of wanting to um, come up with a, a real cheesy, mushy kind of Sunday school class um, for just to make everybody feel good about Mother's Day, we're going to have plenty of that today. But this first lesson of today is not going to be about that. It's about how to become that Proverbs 31 woman. And, uh, you know, I always, the Brother Hustage is teaching this, you know, it's a man's view. Certainly, but I've been married 30 years, and I've been married to a really gracious woman. And the lesson I'm going to teach today <coughs> is about, it's a little different than what you expect even from the title, okay? But uh, here's what I want to do. I want to take, and this is probably not the best atmosphere because we don't have all the young married families in here. But I kind of really want to talk to a generation of ladies. And I want to just give you the brass tacks, straight up, straight forward, and say, look, here it is. And it's in print. I've got it on PowerPoint. It will be on YouTube. You'll be able to come and you check this out and go, okay, look, this is, this is kind of in your face. This is how this works. And I promise you on, the, on Father's Day, I'll preach the other side of this. I'll just promise you that. Today's, today's world is full of imbalance. There's a lot of things that are that are trying to tip the scales on society. Probably even before the 20s and before the 1800s, but definitely during the 50s with Rosie Riveter. I mean, you know that story, we, I can do it, we can do it. The deal is, is that there's a lot of things you can do, but there's some things you probably shouldn't be trying to do. And the exact same thing with men. There's a lot of things you can do, but there's some things you shouldn't do. Okay, uh, and I'm going to say this to us because it's just us, but testosterone has a specific result in the world. Estrogen has a different type of result in the world. And I'm going to keep this real uh, G-rated in this concept. Testosterone is like this. Okay. Estrogen is like this. <laughs> That's very accurate. It is an accurate description. Um, so trying to get those two to blend together and work together is really complex. So today I want to address one kind of side of that, and I want to give a gift some of, to some of the younger generation. And, and I'm pressing this forward because I'm a pastor, and if you don't step out into an area, nobody ever will. You know, society will go about never speaking about these subjects. Society will go about and allow it to grow, to get worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. And granted, I, I understand that most men today do not know how to lead. I'm prefacing that. Because they never had a good role model. Amen? They didn't. They didn't have anybody stand there and show them how to lead. So I grant all the defects on the other side. This is not about them today. This is about you. And in looking at you, you've got to ask yourself, does this apply? Okay? And the, and the idea here is to pay, make a godly Christian woman role model and a godly Christian man role model. And hopefully you can get to that role model before they get married. But that doesn't happen. 
before they even do anything else, all this other stuff is let loose. They do then get married, and then you have no concept of what to do next. And I'm gonna, the reason I'm coming at this, and you might think I do this a little too much, this man won't think, but I do believe it's the cornerstone of our society. The, the Christian family is what holds our society together. And everything in media, everything in print, everything in, in uh, entertainment is all against that. And it's trying to beat it down like nobody's business. If you do that a uh, cross-section of media today, you will find out that in media, every other person is homosexual. That is not the case in reality. It's 2% of our society, a very small percentage of our society. Now here's something else, and I had this uh, conversation with Daisy. She's up in the college and career and she, uh, class. Daisy is from Cuba, and uh, you might not know Daisy. She's been coming to our church for about four weeks now, five weeks. Uh, and um, she, she's from Cuba, and uh, she was sitting there telling me, I'm not sure I like being in America or not. And I said, why? And she says, because of all of the killing and murders and these type of things. And the deal was, as I said, okay, let's let's kind of analyze this. Is it what's on media or what you're actually <coughs> experiencing? She said, it's what I see on media. Uh -huh. right. Media, every other lesson you get from media is right. somebody next door got killed. I've lived in Georgetown uh, almost 20 years now, and nobody next door ever got killed here. We have a very low crime rate, okay? So, and then I, I'll tell you this other thing I threw out to her. I said, I went to Alaska for 10 years and didn't watch almost any news. Well, barely involved in an election while I was there. And then what ended up happening was uh, you turned off the news 10 years, and 10 years later you turned it back on because I came back to the lower 48 where the real people live. But the truth of all that is this, is that nothing really changed. Are you with me? Right. It's still four or five murders a day on media, four or five murders a day on media, four or five murders a day on media. What ends up happening is it's the media, it's not reality. Right. Okay, that's why I'm saying they'll tell you that there's homosexual everywhere, and I'm not here to shoot homosexuals, but the media is feeding you an absolute falsehood, and people are buying into it, thinking it looks lovely. Sin looks lovely. Yes. How many have experienced sin? Does it look lovely? You know, people run. Yeah, they do, but it looks lovely. But once you've eaten it, you know, I'm going to go to Las Vegas. I've met people that come back from Las Vegas. It's very seldom. Man, that was the most wonderful. Uh, no, they've lost money. Different things have happened. You know, they're, they're strung out. All of these other things. It's not what it's being sold to you as. And this great liberty for men to go do whatever they want to do and for women to go do whatever they just feel like you deserve it, go do it, that is a falsehood. Right. That is a falsehood. My, my uh, wife and I have always been advocates of being responsible for your actions yes. and that every action has a cost. Yes. Every action has a cost. Even going on vacation is going to cost you. Yes. I can't go on vacation six months out of the year because of the cost. If I go on a two-week vacation, what happens? I have three or four days when I get back that I have to catch up. Correct? Right. I mean, it's not what it appears to be. Right. And what they're trying to sell you is you're going to live on a luxury lot, a yacht, Luxury lot. <laughs> that could be for people in the low homes. <laughs> but a luxury yacht, and that it's all going to be pristine. There's just really nobody like that. I mean, there's not really anything like that. That's why multi-billionaires, Robin Williams, the funny guy, made everybody laugh. Had great kids. You know, had would have been whatever. The perfect everything goes and kills himself. Why? Because it's not the answer. So today I want to talk to you a little bit about something different. Needs of a husband. And I don't want you ladies going at this saying, you know, Brother Huss is talking about the needs of, his hus of the husband. Uh, you know, um, don't look at this negatively. <laughs> First of all, a husband needs a wife who respects him as a man. As a man. Oh. Huh? Uh, how do I respect him as a man? I mean, the biggest thing here is to step back and kind of go, Lord, how do I do this? That's where you need to start first because you can't really look around. And, you know, uh, here's the way, and I, I really don't like this way, but I'm going to use it because it's the only illustration I have right now. You know your pastor's a man. Most of you ladies respect me quite 
quite a bit. Well, you need to issue that same kind of respect to your husband. Okay? We're going to get way deeper than this, so don't think this is too shallow for me because it's not. We're, we're about to jump off into this. All right. A husband needs a wife to respect him as a man, and this is lesson one. Okay. How does a wife destroy her husband's manliness? Boy, it's just it's so quiet in here. <laughs> I mean, his manliness is the core energy of who he is. That's his ego, that's his strength and everything. And I know nobody that's capable of tearing that down quicker than my wife. If she, she can do certain things and I can be absolutely smaller than a mouse. I can be a roach on the ground. Or she can do one or two little things and they don't have to do with physical. It's in a smile or a word. And I can actually tear down a wall and be the strongest thing in the universe. And I don't know what all that formula is. There's a few ladies in my in our church I would send you to on how to boost your man because their man's a man. Some of you other ones are doing everything you can to sap his manliness. And here's what's going to happen. You are not doing yourself one dime worth of favors. You are taking apart God's society. You are taking apart God's image. And you are making yourself miserable. Number one, by expecting him to know what protection you need. All right, I'll be honest, ladies, you thought, well, he should know what I need. Estrogen, testosterone. He does not know what you need. And sometimes you don't know what you need, but that's a whole other lesson. But uh, the deal is, is that he doesn't know what you need. You know, I discovered something with my wife that was very particular. I moved her around from different places quite a bit, and I found out, uh, you know, just by watching, not her complaining. Everybody knows my wife, she's not a complainer. She's different than most of you ladies in this room. All the guys, I'll tell you, rule during this class, don't even, just barely breathe. <laughs> okay. um, I would move her from a mobile home to an RV to a uh, borrowed home to these things. And then I, I did discover that, hey, when I got her into our own mobile home, uh, she was a lot more at peace. And I recognize, being ditzy like I am, but I watched enough to say, okay, if I get her a home, a, a, a place to live, that might be an opportunity here for her to be more comfortable. She needed a place to nest, you know, to nest. And I don't mean that in a derogatory way. I mean, she needed a place to call her own. So when we bought the home here in Georgetown, it was one of the best things we ever did, the first home we were at. Uh, that, that that became her place of strength, okay? Now, um, overall, I recognize that as the man, okay? But, but I had to kind of feel this thing out and say, is this a good idea? In other words, I had to figure out what her need and it was communication that brought that apart. I, I wouldn't have right off the cuff known that I need to do that. Now, not every woman is that way. There's other sets of needs that are there, and it, it has to be some discovery, but you ladies sitting on top of your needs and not being able to articulate your needs is not doing anything good. Okay? Your physical needs, your spiritual needs, your mental needs, and your emotional needs, these things need to be defined. You know, uh, I, I, you know uh, I know there's always something that the husband's going to offer. Because males are testosterone, women are estrogen. And you can just guess what that one thing they're going to always offer. Okay? But there could be a time when you're saying, hey, all I want you to do right now is hold me. All I want you to do right now is let's go for a walk. Okay? You're going to have to define these things because that guy came programmed to you one way. He actually thought you were just like him. And that, that's one of the problems in the world today is that he's estrogen and she's like this. But I need to tell the guys, she is not a buddy. Even though I married my wife thinking we're going to go out camping, we're going to go out fishing, we're going to go hunting together. Uh, no, no, I married a wife, not a buddy. Amen? Okay, okay. So by expecting him to know what, what, what protection you need, tell your husband 
how he can protect you. And it can also be something as simple as, I would just like, uh, my wife and I, we came up with a budget. She said, if you can bring in this much, I can run the house on this much. Boom. That wasn't some open expectation. Is anybody with me? Yes. Okay. Not, that wasn't some open expectation. Hey, I need $50,000 a week, honey. No, no, no. She said, I'll run the house. You, you give this. Blah, 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 blah. I'll, I'll do this. And boy, we, we fit something kind of cool there. I didn't let anything get in the way of me meeting that expectation. Why? Because I wanted a foundational base for my life. I wanted, in other words, I'm building my life with this woman. My life is nothing without this woman. Okay? We're building something that can withstand a nuclear blast. Now think about that. I mean, you, some of you think that if just a wind comes up, it's going to blow my marriage apart. I'm talking about building something that God's proud of, that you're proud of, that your kids can grow up strong in. And even if your kids go haywire, they won't be able to move it. Okay, that's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about something that reflects Christ and the church. You know, Christ never divorced the church. He never left the church. Okay? Yeah, we're, we're talking about building something strong and powerful. Tell your husband how he can protect you. And don't have a list. Don't run from this. I, some of y'all are going to bug the fire out of it because you're, you're going to make, start making a list. Oh, yeah, he gave me some ammo now. All right. Here's the 37 points. I got this from Brother Hustlich. 37 <laughs> points of what I need. Get out there and give them to me. There's something wrong with you. Not, no, not you. <laughs> There's something wrong with the guy who came up with that list. The thing is, you need to look at this from God's point of view. I'm, I'm really trying to go somewhere here today. Okay, the next one here is by being financially independent. That's you, ladies. I've got my own money. He's got his money. In my home, we do not have separate checking accounts. Okay? My wife is dependent on my productivity. Any woman that discounts that dooms their home. Any woman that has this financial independence, and, and I'm sorry, I mean, I dealt with this with Cheryl and uh, Michael, you know, because Cheryl was a very, most of us know Cheryl. Um, Cheryl was a very uh, self-independent woman. But she marries this guy and she calls me and says, Brother Hustle, what do I do? I said, you take a back seat. You funnel your cash into his checking account. Now, of course, uh, I, I don't even want to give you enough course here. I just want to give you do it. And then you come back to me later and he just spends it all. Well, then you have to back up and you've got to let them fail. You've got to let the whole thing fail. But I'm not going to let this shipwreck get your hands off it. God never designed you to fly the jet plane. Now, yeah, granted, you can fly a plane in literal, but not this plane. Not this, not this thing. That guy has to have nothing between him and God. God has to be the one that breaks his neck and breaks his arms and beats him up. You get in the middle of that trying to protect and control and everything else, this thing's going to go haywire. And that's what's going on. I'm not preaching this by accident or talking about it by accident. Some of you people are thinking you're Christians, but you're blowing it. You're actually destroying this thing, and you can keep the facade up. The next day you look perfect, and the next day you come to me and say, this is over with. It didn't get there overnight. It's behind the scene that this is happening. Okay? What ends up happening here is being financially in, uh, independent. Ladies, ladies, okay, you got a job. No problem. I'm, uh, I, can, I can work with that. I, it, it didn't happen that way in my home. But I can work with the way you do it in your home. I'll adjust. Now, is it, am I going to adjust? Your, talk, your pastor taught me. Am I going to adjust because I think it's the best thing out there? No, I do not think it's the best thing out there. I think that bugger needs to be like this piece right here, and he needs to just be beat. I mean, he needs to be put to work. Go to work, go to work, go to work, go to work. That's what he needs to do. Make money, make money, make money. <laughs> I actually believe that. Because once you get him going, he will discover, whoa, I am designed for this. Man, dig in that fence hole. Put that in. Create something. Build something. Build a bridge. Build a building. I can do this. But not until he decides 
And I'm not saying you're doing that, ladies. Let another man do that. Let another man do that. Because he's going to respond much better to another man getting in his face. But you jump in and say, don't let anybody scream at my Eric like that. Now that would never happen with you because he's been screamed at before. He's had grown men get in his face. Back when he was doing concrete and all that stuff, people were, hey, are you lazy? And here's Eric going, I ain't lazy. <laughs> like this. They're going, you never learn anything? Eric says, I'm learning right now, buddy. I mean, before you know it, he gets to the top of his game. It takes a man to grow a man. Yes. All of your efforts, lady, ladies, Stuff. Can you resurrect that? <laughs> you know, think, uh, ladies, all of you, have, have you discovered, you did a good job, have you discovered that with all of your efforts, how is that working for you? With all of your efforts to manipulate and twist and cause, how is it getting worse or is it getting better? If it's getting worse, stop what you're doing and listen to your pastor. If it's getting worse, stop what you're doing. Okay? By being financially independent, and I, can I spend more time on this? What do you do? How do you surrender that? Well, there's a lot of trust that you have to have in God, not so much in that, you know, you're thinking this man's got to become this, and you've got this picture image in your mind of what this man's got to be. The truth of it is you need to get out of the way and let God make that man into something. It takes a man to make a man. Okay? So what ends up happening is when you're out there and you're competing with him, do not get out there and compete with him. The classic statement is, my wife has said it many a time, she used to fret over the bills until finally one day God spoke to her and said, these belong to your husband. And then your statement to me right now, I just heard it, just telepathy, was, well, he's not going to do it. Then you be quiet and you be poor. You be quiet and let disaster happen. You be quiet and don't be so selfish about having the second car and the plush home. You keep your mouth shut. Because if you'll keep your mouth shut, God will have a chance to do something with your man. What if he craters, becomes an alcoholic? Well, half of y'all support your alcoholic husbands. You're the bigot. I mean, you're, you're an enabler in the front. Oh, I need this. Enough said. The answer to that is center your work and your ministry in your home. Center it in your home. And that means make it a crown jewel. Make this beautiful. Okay? Make it incredible. Amen. There are times in my life when my wife was very dominant and I would not want to come home. After a long day's work, I didn't want to drive home. Because when I got home, I was going to get something right between the teeth. But she made a change, and it made me want to come home. There's nothing better than wanting to go home. Because the person there is still pleasant. It's still genuine. It's still lovely. Oh, yes, I'm reaching back to 1920s stuff and 19 or 1880s stuff. Yes, I am. Why? Because the old paths are still the right paths. Right. And I don't care what you try to shove down my throat. I counsel people. And this is the problem I deal with almost every single week. And everybody's trying to redesign God's plan. You better stop it and go back to God's plan. Everybody wants to do it their way. Everybody's so cocky, it's disgusting. The men and the women both, they all know better than everybody else. Hush up. And go back to the old path. Let's see what God can do. If you'll get out of the way. The next one is by giving greater loyalty to outside leadership. My pa I, we've got people in the church. My pastor, my pastor, my pastor. And the next thing you know, it's my husband. My husband. Oh, my goodness. I, I can't kill you. If I could kill you, we could start over. It'd be like in Moses' time or something. Let him have another chance at something else. Boy, it gets real quiet and I better keep filling the space so we'll run out there. The deal here is by giving loyalty to outside leadership, all these is great. I mean, I got guys that love Trump so much, women that love Trump so much, they're just all about Trump, but their husband. 
Everything in your face and in your action says, my husband's an idiot. He's worthless. Everything you say is that way. Stop it! He needs to be the dude. If he, you ain't making him the dude, he ain't going to be the dude. i gotta, I got to boost him all the time. Well, that's the guy you married. All my wife has to do is wind me up once a year. And buddy, it's time to tear into something. I'm going to buy something. I'm going to build something. I'm going to create something. I'm going to generate something. I mean, most of the time, we're the ones that keep our husbands from being the man. Don't give greater loyalty to your pastor or to your boss. All you see about your boss is he makes money and all that. You don't see how his home life is. And you're starting to look. I mean, that's why I'm not really happy about the idea of us working in a place and an environment where we're tempted like that. Right. I mean, I could point to six to eight to ten different relationships that developed in that manner. Either they ran off with somebody at the sports lifting place where they did their fitness. Or they ran off with somebody at work. And that poor husband can't compete with that. You did it yourself. Nobody. There's no. My eyes are not blinded when these divorces come to me. I recognize what happened. I recognize that my very godly mother-in-law ran my drunk father-in-law off and caused him to never be saved. Why? Because she was righteous. And he just kept being a failure. And she kept telling him that or showing him that and everything else. There's a lot to be said about winning the man you're with. Right. The moment you're thinking about, I'm going to trade this man for another man, you are out. You are so far. By that time, you're way out of the will of God. The problem with the church today, some people think they're saved in the church, but they're not saved. If you have bitterness, if you have jealousy, if you have all of these things going or even in a portion you miss out on heaven. There needs to be a cleanliness in the church and a representation in the church that reflects Jesus Christ. And I'm teaching this, but that doesn't mean I'm perfect. I'm not here to say I'm perfect, but I am, I am the dude <laughs> licensed to teach today. <laughs> and, and, and I do know on this chapter what I am saying. And I am anointed to be a pastor, which gives me supernatural insight. Right. Amen. I want to kick this one to the curb. There's no way you can fix the church overnight. Here's the next thing. Ask your husband your spiritual questions. Stop asking me. Well, my husband's not spiritual. I want to tell you, my dad was a devout Catholic. God's told me to get an answer for my future marriage. I would have to go to my father. I went to my Catholic father. And I said, Dad, I need you to pray about something. Because some, I'm going to ask you a question in about two months when I get home. And I, I need you to answer from God's perspective. And he said, okay, son, I will pray. When I came in, I said, Dad, I want to marry Cassie Frankie. And this is my question to you. He met Cassie. He, he prayed. He said, son, before this happened, he says, I have an answer for you. Even before I ever met her. He said, son, you are supposed to marry this young lady. This is the correct young lady. Now, you think the story ended there. No, because I followed a godly principle and trusted God, God filled my dad later with the Holy Ghost. Are you with me? In other words, God started my dad on a journey of discovery that he would have never found any other way if I didn't go to him with my spiritual question. If you want that man to be spiritual, go to him with your spiritual questions, which should cause him to want to pursue. Now, if you all of a sudden see him react and be afraid of that, then you know he's afraid of these spiritual things. That doesn't mean you need to mentor him or uh, cuddle him or anything else. What needs to happen is you could say, you could direct and say, you know, so-and-so looks interested in the Bible, one of his buddies or something. Why don't you stir this up and, and come up? I mean, Really, you're not trying to lead him. Let me, don't, don't get me wrong here. You're not trying to navigate him. What you're trying to do is just inspire him. Hey, I have a spiritual question. That should inspire him enough if he loves you, if there's love still in the marriage. Well, if there's not love in the marriage, you need to start praying that there's love in the marriage. If we'd start doing this day one, it would have never gone away. 
But we've tried a whole bunch of other methods, and that's messed a lot of things up. But ask your husband your spiritual questions. And how does a wife destroy her husband's manliness? Number two, in the next page. By resisting his decisions in your spirit. This is the one I find most. <coughs> he makes a decision. You don't like his decision. You're going to resist him. I mean, you're not going to out and out rebel. I mean, he's bigger than you, stronger than you. But you're going to manipulate the whole situation to get your will done. That's not going to be helpful. Learn to wisely appeal to your husband. That means... My wife knows I've had an anger problem for all these years. Uh, uh, you know, my, oh, I won't pick on anybody. Okay, we won't do that today. <laughs> the overall picture is this, is that my wife knows there is a certain place to ask me certain questions. It's not when I walk through the door and I just came through the door from a very hard day. She does not hit me right between the eyes with a list of questions. She waits. And it's, I discovered that sometimes she'll wait for two days. Well, I don't want to be the man that's not approachable. Anybody listening to me? I'm tired of having to wait two days for her to be, feel comfortable enough to ask me a question. So I need to adjust myself. Okay, ladies, that's an example of a man governing himself. I need to change so that she can ask me five minutes later. In other words, I come in and yes, she'll give me a break, but know that 15 minutes later she can ask me the question comfortably because she knows I'm not going to lose my temper. Are you with me? That's a man adjusting himself from being this way to this way because he's attentive to his home. Okay? Learn to wisely appeal. Why? You know, hey, I'm going to go buy this vehicle. My husband's a spendthrift. He spends all the money. Well, you're going to have to go through that the first time and be a pauper. And hopefully he's going to wake up and say, I don't want to be a pauper. I want to find some way to do this better. Most of the men in this church will work with the men to kind of become more financially secure. We know all kinds of things about uh, buying things and selling things and storing up money and all kinds of things we know in this church. And if they're too ditzy to go ask somebody, it's unfortunate. But that's what you married. You take what you have. It's not a random catch. You take what you have and you make the best of it. Amen. 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 <laughs> you know, why can a person who is in a wheelchair and another person who can't speak get married and still have a great life? Because they work together. Mm -hmm. The only reason you're not having a, a great life is you're not desperate enough for it. By resisting his physical affection. First uh, Peter 3 and 1. Likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands, so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives. I had a guy that was coming along in God, and, and, and the wife begged me to help win him to God. And I put out this monumental effort with a group of other men. And we started to get him going. And he started to get interested. As soon as he got interested, she got jealous. Because we started giving all this attention to him and not to her anymore. So what it ended up happening is she, she finally he called me and says, I can't come, I can't be with you guys anymore. I said, why? Because of her. Her jealousy was accusatory and caused him to not want to. Somebody needs to go. Realize the craziness of this. How many times have I dealt with that? <coughs> I'm not going to go over 10 times, but in the last 15 years, I've dealt with that at least 10 times. In this church. He starts getting good because I'm good with guys. They start walking and start realizing I can live for God. She gets jealous and starts eroding his walk with God and wanting me to doubt that he's even godly. With phone calls. You know what he did? He did this. Thinking, what are you trying to do? Tear apart your home? That's exactly what you're doing. I know nobody's going to pay me for this message. <laughs> this is the unspoken crushing of a man's spirit when you resist his physical affection. When a man wants to be intimate with you, that's his way of saying, I love you. I don't care what your love language is. If it's washing dishes, that's fantastic. And you're saying, washing dishes, I love you, I love you, I love you. You're going to have to change something about you and recognize that physical affection is his way of saying he loves you. 
Okay, girls. Okay, we're safe in this room. Okay. I'm seeing the ages in here. I can't even go there. Uh, it's going to go on video. So I really can't say what I want to say, but there's not a whole lot that goes into maintaining a guy. I've heard every excuse in the world. I'm in pain. It hurts. Some of that's a lie. There might be some physical truth to that. And it shouldn't be inappropriate. And I've heard everything. But the truth of it is, giving a little bit of time could bring about a much better relationship. Oh, he only comes knocking at the door when he wants something. The test room. I, 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 I hate you ladies sometimes. <laughs> the test room. You see, it's all peaks and valleys. There's nothing soft about the test room. You know, it'd be nice to have estrogen sometimes. <laughs> Have a look, Michelle. How's this look on me? You like the socks? We are paramountly different, but there's a criteria. There's, there's a critical mass here. Don't look in from your comfort zone of estrogen, which I know. I know there's hot flashes and all kinds of other things that go along with it. But it is more comfortable than estrogen. Estrogen is like having a knife on the edge of your spinal cord. You have no idea. Is there any man in this room that disagrees with me? Estrogen is the most ruthless domestic. Testosterone is. Did I say testosterone was like a knife? Okay, testosterone is ruthless. It's ruthless. It's a. It's a. It's a very, 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 very demanding complex hormone and I, I don't want you to have to experience that I like my wife the way she is I like her in her estrogen environment <laughs> okay and I've learned to maneuver through that but I want you to understand from that position you cannot stand on a white tower and say oh look he's just a, like a monster yeah. that is a hormone Amen. and if you would figure it out he'd be the most peaceful guy you ever met But you've got control, right. just like Adam and Eve. <coughs> she desired to rule over him. The moment you take control of that, you become evil. I'm telling you right now, you become evil. Wives, submit yourself to your husbands. Now, I pray that the Holy Ghost works on all sides and you come up with all kinds of things because I've heard every kind of excuse in the world it seems like a whole list of excuses why, you know, we can't play along with this thing you're talking about, Bill Hustich, but you need to give it a try. Yes. That's what my wife does. My wife, in a million years, my wife would not say, I'm not the mood. Shame on you if that's every third word out of your mouth. My wife recognizes me spending time with her is the best thing for all of us. My wife has a calendar on her wrist. Hey, you ain't been knocking at the door. Come on. You can put that. I, I'm being I'm just being honest. You want to keep your guy and make this thing work. He's not interested in me. Make him interested in me. I don't want to go pet a porcupine neither. <laughs> <laughs> Do I hear an amen? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's good. It's hard to hug a I get so worried at times. 
I can close my eyes and start praying and see about 10 different couples. We're only 25 couples in this church. Yes. And I can see what you're doing to your own home. And I'm kind of like, and now today I'm dancing with the ladies, but I'm going to be dancing with the guys. But the overall thing is, with the guys, it's brutal. You've got to hit the uh, no, donkey. Uh, when I was a young guy, my parents got me a, a Shetland pony. They're not very nice. Don't ever buy a Shetland pony. Now, and, even if you like horses, don't buy a Shetland pony. But um, this one bumped me off all the time. And we had a guy come over to break it. And they got on this Shetland pony with a bat. And every time he, he bucked, that guy would hit him as hard as he possibly could. Right between the eyes. Oh, yeah. Who, did any of you guys go? Did any, any guy in this room go? Did any of y'all do that? No, that was all women. <laughs> You are broken, and take it from me, you are broken. You needed to pop that Shetland pony between me. Finally broke the back, and I got him another back. I was a young man watching him break this animal from hurting people. Right. That's what he's doing. In order to break the animal from hurting people, it took a grown man that was determined in what happened. We fixed the animal. Okay, that's what happens to guys. You're going to have to hit them between the head with, with that. Right? <laughs> that. That will work. Okay. Well, here, the latter part. Um, a wife's godliness is a powerful guard against her husband's abuse. And I want to mention this. Oh, he's going to abuse me. <laughs> My wife's godliness prevented me from ever abusing her. I'm not a drunk sailor coming in wanting to abuse my wife. I do not think my wife's running around on me that I feel like I need to dominate her. My wife is a precious jewel of the living God. I lay hands on her respectfully. Amen? Better get through this before we get caught in here by other people. Learn the power of prayer based on Scripture. James 5.16, Therefore confess your sins one to another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. It works. Learn the power of prayer based on Scripture. In other words, you need to pray about this situation forward and backwards. Right. Last but not least, by taking matters into your own hands, and this goes back to the financial thing, but when a wife intrudes into one's responsibility, her husband often surrenders other responsibilities as well. It didn't turn out like you thought. You went out and got this going, and you were going to cover this loose end that he wasn't obviously couldn't see because he's such a ditzy guy. And you went to go take care of this thing, and you wrapped your hands all around it. What ends up happening is, yes, that one thing might be fixed for a moment, but because you stepped in there, he's going to let go of four of the things. And your little plan to go and fix it is not working. Right. When a wife intrudes into one's responsibilities, somebody else's, her husband often surrenders other responsibilities as well. A wife may avoid temporary consequences by cause ultimate but cause ultimate destruction. She might temporarily hold this thing off. The wisest of women builds her house, but falling with her own hands tears it down. Right. Don't sit here and tell me that women don't tear these homes apart. If they might come out innocent, there's no innocence in a divorce. Right. Everybody's guilty. Do not become your husband's conscience. Wisely appeal wrong decisions and then give him room to fail. What you want to do is get the husband at the head of the pack. If somebody gets shot, he gets shot. If somebody gets kicked, he gets kicked. But if you get a reward, he gets a reward. Okay? There's a process to getting this machine going in the right direction. Okay, I'm going to say something. This is not going to be friendly. Some of your men 
are looking elsewhere because you're so dominant. Most men can't feel affectionate toward a very dominant woman. I don't mean smart. That's not dominant. I don't mean capable. That's okay. I love I have a capable woman. I have a very smart woman. I have a very feminine and loving woman that draws me into her bed. I'm not going somewhere else. Why? What do I got? Even Pentecostals sometimes so, Yeah. You know, in other words, we love y'all. I want to be productive here today. I don't want to be destructive. But what I want to say is that with what you're doing is if it's not working and you're recognizing it's not working, you need to abandon it utterly and start over. Ten years of marriage, I did the Pentecostal formula. It wasn't working because on the surface it looked Pentecostal. She looked right. I looked right. We were living together. But the more she had children, the more I was alienated. I felt like she, also the only reason she married me was to have kids. Many men feel that way. Okay, she got what she wanted. So from here on out, I'm not never getting what I want. Which was a partner. Not just a sexual partner, but a partner in life. And at that 10 year mark, something slapped me across the face and said, grow up and be a man. I went to a seminar. The seminar just basically, the seminar didn't say this, but you know when you're in a Holy Ghost environment, the Holy Ghost speaks to you things that might be totally different than the seminar. And the seminar just basically said, you're as guilty as she is for destroying this marriage. I came home, I got on my knees, came in the door, she knew something was different. It took me deciding to just abandon everything, all my thoughts, all my unforgiveness, all my bitterness, everything, just abandon it so that I could possibly start over. And I hit my knees, she didn't know what was going on because we were not intimate, we were not as friendly as we are now, okay? I hit my knees and I just said, look, I want to say I'm sorry. And she's like, what are you talking about? I said, I'm sorry for, for what I've done to damage this relationship. I'm sorry for my anger that has pushed you away. I'm sorry for not being the father to my kids I want to be. I'm sorry for not being the husband I want to be. And I don't care if i got to throw away every ounce of ministry. But I want to somehow find a way to you and to serve you and to love you. She had no idea what I was saying. She listened to me. Here's what she heard in her brain. God speaking to her saying, if you don't change the way you are, this marriage is over. That's what God said to her. I'm glad God was in the middle talking to me and talking to her. Right. <clears throat> if you are listening and you do, I mean, you know, I've heard this from ladies so many, y'all are so complicated for us, you can't even fathom it. A woman says, well, he just doesn't listen to me. And he goes, I'm listening, Brother Hustler. I'm listening. I'm trying to listen. Well, I mean, she's speaking this way, and it's a high pitch, and you're speaking here, and it's a low pitch. You're just not picking it up. Right? right. There's a place where you've got to really listen. And I'm talking to the guys for a moment. You've got to really listen. When she says, you know, uh, well, obviously, when she says take out the trash, it usually means take out the trash. <laughs> but when she comes in, and she's real busy, and you're sitting there on the couch, and she says, I'm going to get to those that, that laundry in a few minutes, or I'm going to get to those dishes in a few minutes. What does that say to you? Get up and help her. <laughs> yeah, I didn't need to hear from you. I needed to hear from him. Get up and help her. Absolutely. How, how long have you been married, buddy? 50 years. 50 years. <laughs> and I know that she still likes you. <laughs> and there's no doubt in your mind that she still likes you, right? I mean, Knowing her, she probably still gets goosebumps when you walk through that house sometimes. That's kind of nice. Amen. I mean, you don't feel that way. I don't understand. We're men, but it's nice when she feels that way. Absolutely. Amen. So where am I going with that? And it said, you've got to listen and kind of, and ladies, 
Everything I told you today is rock solid. It is, it is what it takes. I'm going to run through it backwards real quick. By taking matters into your own, in your own hands, don't do that. Uh, do not become your husband's conscience. In other words, you are not have to be the one who judge him all the time. That one where I get the phone call and say, yeah, Brother Hustage, I know you're talking to this guy in church, but you better not talk to my husband. Why? You know, he's a sinner, Brother Hustage. Huh. Where on earth do you think that's going to help anything? You don't think I know we're all sinners? Right. I don't need a list from you to understand whether your husband's bad or not. Shame on you that you would shift your loyalty to me away from your husband to kill your husband. Right, right. Don't take matters into your own hands. Get them into God's hands. By resisting, learn the power of prayer based on Scripture. Pray until something happens. Most of you the other day, uh, hey, have you prayed about this? No, 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 no. Yeah, I prayed about it. I knew right then. It was like, oh, yeah, Lord, help me. No, you're not going to help I want to move on. That was their prayer. <laughs> uh, the other ones, have you fasted about it? No. I didn't fast about it. No, you need to fast about it. Okay, by resisting his physical affection. Don't. Don't. Hey, you got what you bought for. If this guy's got a high demand, he's got a high demand. So what? At least he's not out here being tempted by pornography and all these other things to go out elsewhere. He's tempted by you. Hey, I would be flattered. Kind of hard for me to go there, but... <laughs> you know, it, it would be flattering. I mean, my goodness, most people would be delighted to have people just, you know, stymied by them and, uh, you know, attracted to them. Right? I think so. Uh, this next one is by resisting his decision in your spirit. Boy, we know very well when you're not on board with us. Amen. I listen to my wife when she's not on board and she's just playing along. I said, look, I need to know your real opinion here. Amen? I need to really know because I depend on my wife's insight because she has keen insight. She's my trusted advocate. All right, next is this. Okay, by giving greater uh, loyalty to outside leadership, do not place somebody in the position that your husband is in. And I've seen it many times. Ladies go out in the workplace, they fall in love or stymied or attracted to their boss. They might not ever bring it that way. The biggest thing I hear nowadays is my wife is having an affair. And I say, where is she having an affair? She's having a, a, uh, an emotional affair with somebody at work. Or somebody outside of the home. She's having an emotional affair on social media or something like that. And I'm trying to tell the church right now how to get rid of these things. Yes. By being financially independent, if you're dominant, you've made your bucket, you're going to be swimming in it. If my wife turned on Cassie Hustledge full blown, I would be sitting at home in a recliner, drinking my beer, watching TV. I'd be 400 pounds. But my kids would be all backslidden and sleeping around and all kinds of other things. But because Cassie took the back seat and said, look, I could probably fix this faster than he could. But I'm going to take a back seat and allow God to do something. I don't know if she had all that wisdom in her youth. She does now. But in her youth, she was just praying. Right. She was a praying woman. And lo and behold, God moved in. And God got me in one. I told David this story the other day. I'm only going to give you a little part of it. But I shared with him how a pastor stepped into my life and literally beat the fire out of me. Emotional. And caused me to desire to grow up. And because that pastor stepped into my life, I'll never be the same again. I moved to the forefront. A brother, a man to man, he said, look here, I'm going to show you how to make money. That's exactly what he told me. So I've been practicing those principles, and it kind of helped take care of the home, some other things, but being financially independent will destroy her heart. All right, last one is this. By expecting him to know what protection you need. You need to be able to show him, explain to him, and tell him. We got some great books on this. I, this basically comes out of this pamphlet. It's called Seven Basic Needs of a Husband. There's a whole lot more. That was one need of a husband. There you need. I'm sorry. 
Okay. The other, other one is this resource manual, Training Faithful Women. And you'll find in this resource manual, it's all about having a life message. And ladies, if you want to have a life message, this is what to find. Now, all of these are available. Just find Cody, uh, our assistant to the pastor, Cody Castonia, and he'll be able to show you where those are at. There's a small <coughs> fee, and I'll leave you. God bless y'all. Let's all stand together.